I guess you could almost say I went back and tried to check over some records that I had. And I guess you could sort of say I'm close to being a member. <laughs> an honorary one anyway. I went back and checked my records, Brother Josh, and over close to a 30-year period, I've preached in this pulpit just shy of 150 times. And uh, as I look across this auditorium, I see some of you that wasn't even here when I began. Some of you that were here that's now married and got kids and their kids have got kids. And so I, this place is very, very dear to my heart. Very, very dear to my heart. I'm glad that my dad took me to hear Burl Harold Noble that sort of spoke to my heart when I was lost and undone. What was it you were saying, Brother Harold? <laughs> but it is, a, it is a delight. And uh, the thing that I, that I find most difficult for me in meetings like this is uh, fitting in. Uh, I, I want to fit in. I was trying to come down the road the other day and trying to somehow to describe the, my anxiety that I have when I go to camp meetings and those type of meetings. And I, I finally got a hold of the joy where, how, how, how I feel. I feel like a pork barbecue sandwich at Bar Mitzvah. That's exactly the way I feel. But somebody somewhere may sin and want what I've got. Amen. But it is, it is a delight to be here. And in reality, I'm, I'm being totally honest with you tonight. I believe that there's help tonight in what the Lord has put upon my heart. And that much of what has been going on leading up to this aspect of the service has sort of set the stage to help magnify or accentuate the thought that is upon my heart. I found the truth that I want to magnify tonight. I only found it about three weeks ago. This year I celebrated my 60th birthday in salvation. And uh, I love the Word of God. I love to study the Word of God. And I found out a long, long time ago that within the Word of God, this book, is built by principles and precepts. And as a young Christian, I began to understand that if I could identify those precepts or those principles, that I could put them to work in my own heart, in my own life for a benefit. God, when He made this world, He designed certain Scientific principles that are unalterable, unchangeable. You'll not, you can fight them, you can do what you want to do to try to overcome them or alter them, but they, they will not change. You're the loser if you try to oppose them or fight them. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, just get up on the pinnacle of this building, decide that you can fly and jump off and See what happens. You say, what happens? There is, a divide, there is a principle known as gravity. And it's going to kick in and you're going to be the loser trying to fight. And much of what has went on on this altar tonight 
when we do not want to admit it, is literally the repercussions of us trying to defy it certain divine principles that God has put in place in the life of the child of God. I want you to turn with me tonight, if you will, to Exodus chapter number 14. And I want to preach tonight out of this thought, the trilogy of faith. The trilogy of faith. Notice in Exodus chapter number 14, we'll begin reading in verse number 10. You won't need to turn in your Bible. I want to quote another verse that's found in the Old and in the New Testament. And that verse is, The just shall live by faith. The Bible said in verse number 10, and when Pharaoh drew nigh to the children, of, the children of Israel, lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye see today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall, uh, and ye shall, uh, ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Let's pray. Our gracious and most kind Heavenly Father, we're indeed grateful for the privilege and the honor of, of being able to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for what you have already begun to do and uh, the liberation that you have brought to many hearts tonight. Uh, even as Brother Joey has mentioned, uh, Lord, we cannot bear these burdens, these trials, the adversity, what, whatever it is that is impeding our life. Lord, we cannot bear them alone. But Lord, I'm glad that you have uh, provided a way, a means... Uh, a wherewith of escape, that we can live the Christian life with victory and joy and a song within our heart. Lord, you've come that we might not have just life, but life more abundantly. Lord, I pray that you would help me to bring forth this divine truth that you have worked within my heart that will be a help and an aid for the children of God tonight. And we'll love you and thank you and praise you for all that you're doing. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. When we come to our text tonight, we, we come upon a portion of Scripture uh, that is giving us the story of Israel's deliverance uh, uh, from Egyptian bondage. It reveals how that they have faithfully responded to the Word of God and they have been brought out from under with the mighty hand of God by the means of the blood of the Lamb. They have been delivered from the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt in their life. 
But there's an underlying uh, uh, story here. Uh, there's not just this immediate picture, uh, but, but within our story tonight the, of the text, there, there is a divine and eternal principle. But may I say that divine and eternal principle uh, is just not laid out in this passage here. But it begins in the book of Genesis and it runs through all the way through of the book of the Revelation. In order to grasp this principle, this truth that I want you to understand tonight, uh, the first thing we must do, we must address what I call uh, that, that, that faulty perspective uh, uh, when it comes to this idea of faith. As I said in the Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible said, and the just shall live by faith. But may I say many times as the children of God, and as I said, uh, much of what I'm preaching tonight, I didn't learn until about uh, two, three weeks ago. I wish I'd learned it uh, years and years and years ago, Brother Joe. There is in many of our lives this, what I call this, this, this single dimension of faith. Uh, when we think about this idea of faith, we know uh, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We know we were saved by faith. We, we understand uh, that aspect of, 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 of some things of, of what faith does and how faith operates and how faith works in our life. But most of us, I think if you're like I am, uh, Brother Marty, we look at it as a single dimension. Uh, you say, what do you mean, Brother Bob? We see it as a single dimension with only an effect uh, upon our life and nobody else's life. Uh, we look at faith uh, as something, well, uh, if I do it, if I respond, uh, I will be blessed, I, I will be benefited, uh, I will be helped. Uh, but we see it as, as a single dimension within our life. Over in the New Testament there, in the Word of God, Jesus is trying to describe uh, the power and the ability of, of what faith will do. And he said, if you had faith uh, and you were to say to this mountain, I be thou removed, uh, I literally it would be removed and cast into the sea. He said, if you could say to this sycamore tree, uh, uh, be plucked up by the roots, uh, literally the inaction of faith uh, would cause uh, that tree to be uprooted and literally taken from where it's at. For Brother Nobles, when we read those passages, we see it as a single dimension. We see it as a benefit uh, to us or a help to us. Uh, we somehow see it in one sphere and only one sphere only. But may I say when it comes uh, to this idea of faith uh, and he says uh, the just shall live by faith. May I say uh, it not only touches uh, a one sphere but it touches a multitude of spheres in our life. In order to show you what I'm talking about tonight. I want to bring out three or four uh, aspects uh, in this trilogy of faith. I want you to notice from our text tonight, first of all, the setting of faith. The setting of faith. Now, notice here the children of Israel now down with their backs against the Red Sea. A Pharaoh's coming down with his army. Fear is set in and, and, and raging within their hearts and raging within their life. But here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice within this setting here that this is not a happenstance. This is not an accident. This is not that, uh, Brother Josh, something that just sort of uh, reoccurs uh, uh, in our life. In other words, uh, as we look, as you may have come uh, to the altar tonight, and there was a need in your life, and there was something out there pressing, and it's driving you uh, into the presence of God and encouraging you uh, to act in faith. Uh, may I say, that's not just something that happened. That, that's not just something that is a, a single occurrence. Uh, you say, what are you trying? to say, Brother Bob, I'm trying to say that it is totally, a completely orchestrated by God Himself. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at the children of Israel here. I look in Exodus chapter number 13 uh, uh, there in verse number 17. I notice here that it's God the one. Uh, he's the bringing it to pass. Uh, uh, when Pharaoh would let the people go, God, now notice this, 
God led them out through the Philistine, uh, away of the land of the Philistines, uh, although it was, uh, uh, that was near. Uh, and God said, lest preadventure uh, the people repent when they see war, uh, they return unto Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed uh, out of the land of Egypt. In verse number 2 of chapter 14, He said, And ye shall camp by the sea. You say, what's your point? My point, Brother Jimmy, is they're right where God wanted them to be. To be anywhere else would have been out of the will of God. They've been brought to that very point that the sea is here, the mountains are here, the wilderness is here, and Pharaoh's back there. You need to understand whatever it is that's troubling your life or coming into your life that somehow is bringing you to a point that you must believe God and trust God and act on what God is doing. It didn't just happen. It's not something that that just occurs in life. There is a sovereign God and He is leading. He is guiding. He is directing. He is bringing that about in the life of His children. But may I say, not just for the children of Israel, may I say Pharaoh is there because God wants him there. You say, what do you mean? Notice in chapter 14 and verse 3 through 4, uh, for Pharaoh will say, who's talking this? God's saying it. He's telling us what Pharaoh's thinking. He's telling us what Pharaoh's going to do. He'll say, uh, and they are entangled in the, in the land of the wilderness uh, and shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, and I will honor, I will be honored uh, upon Pharaoh and upon uh, uh, his host uh, uh, that, the, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. You say, what do you mean, Brother Bob? I'm saying not only has the mighty hand of God directed step by step, moment by moment uh, to bring uh, uh, bring the children of where, uh, Israel where they need to be. May I say, that thing that's troubling you, that thing that's after you, that thing that's bothering you, that thing that, that somehow right now appears to be your worst enemy is not there by accident. You say, why is it there? Because God's brought it there. Not only, uh, not only are the children of Israel why, right where they need to be, Brother Marty. And not only are the, the enemy or Pharaoh where he needs to be and, and the enemy of your soul where he needs to be. But may I say tonight, God's right, right where he needs to be. You say, who else is there? I'll tell you who's there. Not only are the children of Israel there, Brother Josh. Not only is Pharaoh there. But God's there. You say, what's he doing? He's orchestrating the, uh, the setting of faith. He's bring, you say, well, that's just an instant, Brother Bob. Well, let me take you back to the Garden of Eden. And God formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into man the breath of life. And, and he formed man. And what did he do? He put him in a garden. Now, he could have put him in any garden. Now, maybe you don't think like I do, but I want to ask you a question. Why did he put him in a garden with a tree? I mean, why, what, do you need, what, what do you need with that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You say, what's he doing? He's orchestrating an opportunity for Adam to enact faith. Now, we know he miserably failed, but whether you like it or not, that's what God did. He didn't need to put that tree there. He didn't have to put that tree there. But he's orchestrating a event. Uh, 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 in the life of, of Adam what, what, what about uh, let's take for instance uh, uh, what about Elijah over there he's down there by the brook uh, and uh, uh, the Bible says uh, I've commanded a widow woman over there to sustain the you say well brother Bob I know why he's going to move him he's going to move him uh, because uh, the brook's drying up well let me ask you a question 
What difference does that make to God? The best I remember, he's had a crowd out here in the wilderness. He's been feed, he's been they've been drinking out of a rock for uh, for thirty eight years. Uh, uh, what in the world is he? What does what, what difference does it make uh, uh, that that the brook's drying up? Uh, that pro, brook's probably got rocks in it. Uh, I'm sure if he can get water out of one rock, he can get rock out of another rock. Uh, best I know, the ravens didn't quit coming. Best I know, you say what's he doing? He's going to take him down to a place, uh, put him in a position uh, to worry by. Hey, you got a choice. I'm orchestrating. I'm guiding. I'm directing. I'm going to be there. Your enemy of of death and heartache is going to be there. But listen, you go down there because I'm setting up an event to enact faith. What about old Job? Here's a man that feareth God in the school of evil. Here's the man that 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 God's going to use to black the eye, I black the eye of Satan. You say, well, how's he going to do it? He can't do it but one way. He's got to orchestrate an event, a, a setting. He's got to put it in a in a, 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 a an event to whereby uh, old Job's going to say, hey, I'm going to mind God, live for God, serve God. I'm going to I'm going to be brought to a place uh, of whereby I must believe and trust uh, and act faith in God. You say, what are you trying to say? I, I'm trying to say, you can go from Genesis 1-1, go through the entire book of the Revelation, and every place that you find someone brought to a place that they must take the Word of God and believe it and act on it, can I tell you who orchestrated that event? It was God Himself. You say, what's your point? You may think you're in a strange position, but you're not tonight. There's a God in heaven that knows everything there is to know about you. And just like he brought them children of Israel out there and bumped them up against the Red Sea on one side and put the mountain on one side and put the wilderness on the other side and put Pharaoh on the other side, that same sovereign God knows you and he's leading you and guiding you and, and, and listen, and you may be in the point they were. You may be trying to figure out what God's doing. You may be trying to figure out, uh, trying to get over this aspect of being fearful. You may have been a think of a thousand ways in which uh, you could have averted this. They thought, they said, you know what they said? If we could have had it our way. And you know where we're living tonight? You know why I mean it? Now, listen, I'm not... I don't want you to be upset with me. But the reason so many times we find ourselves uh, repenting on the altar is we wanted our way and we got our way. There's the setting of faith. Then look, if you will, in chapter number 14 and verse number 13. And I want you to not only see the setting of faith, but I want you to see the spheres of faith. You, you say, what do you mean? Now, this, this is the part I'm, ta- I'm, trying to, I'm trying to bring across because I want to tie it in with something. Uh, the, the, when we think about this idea of faith, we think of we think it as, I said, single dimension. We, we think it as one, one dimensional. But, but notice in, in the verses here, in verse number 13, they, there's three there's three spheres, uh, there's three objects, there, there's three worlds that's being touched here. You say, who are you talking about? Well, notice that there's the people. There's the Lord and there's the Egyptians. Now, if you want to go ahead and get to where I'm going, is just write these words down. There's self, there's Satan, and there's the sovereign. Every time you come to a place that there is the setting of faith, it's linked to self, Satan, and the sovereign. Those three worlds are right there at that point in time. You say, that ain't true. Well, isn't that what was true in the garden? Isn't that, isn't that what's true in, in Job's life? Yes, and the truth of the matter is, I don't know what, what you're troubled with. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. But I want to tell you right now, three spheres are, are at war with one another. There's self, there's the sovereign, and there's Satan. Yes. See, it's not single dimensional. 
there's a trilogy. There, there, there's three worlds that, that are going, and every one of these spheres are, are being affected. Now, please get this. This is what I want you to get. Every one of them is going to be affected by what these people do. I don't know what you came to do tonight. I don't know if you come and enacted in faith, but I want to tell you what it did. It, when, you, when you responded in faith, every one of these, every one of these worlds were, were affected by, by when you did or did not enact in faith. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, notice, notice if you will tonight, the sufficiency of faith. Now, the sufficiency of faith is affected. In other words, true faith, active faith, is touched in many areas. Notice, first of all, in verse number 22, I mean, verse 21 and 22, notice that the sufficiency of faith is revealed in help to the believer. In help to the believer. You say, well, look, look what it said. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by the strong wind and all that night and made the uh, sea uh, uh, dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel uh, went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters thereof uh, were a wall unto them on one of the right hand and on the left hand. In other words, here they are. They're, 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 they're backed up. Uh, uh, Pharaoh's on one side. The, 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 the uh, uh, mountain's on one side. The, 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 the uh, wilderness on the other side. And God says uh, unto, the, unto Moses, you tell the people, raise your rod. Tell the people, move forward. You've got a word from God. Now you've got, you've got a choice. You're going to either enact in faith or rebel. You say, what happens if I act in faith? I'll tell you what happens if you act in faith. There's hell. There's hell. I mean, here they are, Brother Mark. All of a sudden, I don't know if you've seen it. I've never seen it. But all of a sudden, here it is. A, a wind begins to blow. And the next thing you know, walls of water are raised up. And somewhere close to a million and a half Jews uh, find, the, uh, find the, the bottom of that, that sea dried up, uh, almost like a sidewalk. And all of a sudden, here they go. They go walking across. Uh, uh, there's deliverance. Uh, there's help when you act in faith. But notice, not only is there help for the children of Israel, deliverance, but notice in verse number 24 through 27 that there is a halting or hindering of the Egyptians in their defeat. Notice what the Bible said. And it came to pass in the morning Morning watch, the Lord look, uh, uh, look, uh, took upon the, looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of, pillar of fire and of the cloud, and he troubled the host of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels uh, uh, that, they, that they drove them heavy, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee uh, from the, from the uh, face of Israel, uh, for the Lord uh, fighteth for them against the Egyptians, and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, uh, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, uh, and upon their chariots, uh, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned uh, to, the strength, uh, to his strength. Uh, under the morning appeared, and the Egyptians uh, fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians uh, in the midst of the sea. Now you say, what are you trying to say, Brother Bob? Now here's what I want you to see. I've never seen it until three weeks ago. Maybe you, maybe you have. If you did, let me, just let me glory my ignorance a day or two, okay? You say, what's your point? Now think about what God just done. He linked the faith of Israel and their deliverance. He linked it to the defeat of the foe that pursued them. You say, I, I don't understand. Well, let me ask you a question. If Israel hadn't went into the Red Sea, would Pharaoh went into the Red Sea? Do you understand what I just told you? 
Do you understand the magnitude of what I just gave you? Their obedience not only brings deliverance, but their obedience brings death to the enemy that they're scared of. You say, Brother Bob, why do I keep fighting him? I'll tell you why I keep fighting him. You're not living in faith. You're not doing what God told you to do. It doesn't make any difference. Go to Genesis 1. Go, go all the way through the book of the Revelation. Every time the child of God is obedient to what God tells him to do, not only is there deliverance for the child of God, but there's defeat for the very thing that's chasing that God. Chasing him. That, that, that widow woman that was down there, what was her fear? She had that pot and she said to, uh, to Elijah, Hey, listen, I've, I've not got just but a little cruise of oil. I haven't got but just a, enough meal. Me and the boys go make a fire, eat a little hearth cake, and die. You say, what's she afraid of? She's afraid of death. You say, what's going to keep her from, uh, from not dying? I'll tell you what it is. Being obedient to what God tells her to do. Her obedience is not going to deliver her, but it's going to defeat the enemy of death in her life. Amen. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? The great truth that God has given to you tonight. If you'll be obedient, not only. Hey, listen, uh, over there, read the verse. I don't know if it excites you. God has told Moses, and Moses tells them, Hey, these Egyptians that you now see, we will never see them again. How do you do that? Be in faith. But you know the good news, it don't stop there. You say, what do you mean, Brother Bob? He links our deliverance to their defeat to the declaration of His glory. You, you say, what do you mean? Look what He does here in, in verse, number, verse number 4. He says there in the chapter, He said, And I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and, and shall uh, fall upon him, and I will get honor unto Pharaoh. Look at verse number 17. And behold, I will harden uh, the heart of Pharaoh, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor unto Pharaoh. Uh, also verse number 18. Also verse number 31. Look what it said. And Israel should know the great work that the Lord hath done unto the Egyptians and, and the uh, people fear the Lord and believe the Lord and his servant Moses. Uh, you say what happens? The truth of the matter is when they're obedient they get deliverance. Uh, when they're obedient they're, the enemy's defeated. When the enemy's defeated there's the declaration of the honor and the glory of God. The reason God's not being glorified in many of our lives uh, is we are not living by faith. Uh, his glory Glory is determined by what we do. You say, well, how long does that last? Well, let me, let's fast forward a little bit. We got two old boys walk in to Harley's house. She said, I know who you fellas are. And I know why you're here. And let me tell you what your God's done to us. He's melted every one of our hearts because you know what we've heard? We heard what kind of God you got at the Red Sea. You say, well, I don't understand. Do you understand the reason God does not get more glory than He does? It's because His people aren't walking by faith. Every time that he sets up a setting that you get the opportunity to respond in faith and you don't, you know what happens? Your enemy is well and alive and God gets a black eye. Let me say it again. Every time God orchestrates an opportunity for faith in your life and you fail to respond in obedience, you cease to enjoy deliverance. You cease to bring death to the enemy that's pursuing you. And you cease to allow God to receive the declaration of His glory and His honor. The choir sings, look what great God, things God's doing. The only way that God can do great things is when you walk in obedience and faith. 
See, Brother Mike, whether I like it or not, I wish I'd known it 30 some years ago, 60 some years ago when I got saved. Because it, it, it makes this thing a living by faith and walking by faith much, much greater than, than just a single, single uh, plane or single sphere or single a- act in my life. It means that, that every time that I'm brought to a point that I can enjoy and respond in faith to the truth of the Word of God, not only am I bringing deliverance to my enemy, I mean bring for me, but I'm bringing death and destruction to my enemy and I'm bringing glory and honor to God. Well, let me show you one other thing and I'm through. Not only do we see the sufficiency of faith, but we see the strategy of faith. You say, what, what do you mean, Brother Bob? Well, the truth of the matter is, until they settle this enemy, they cannot go any farther than they are. They, they, if you read the text, they've already told us what, that we've only got one or two choices. We can either go into the Red Sea or we can go back to Egypt and serve, serve Pharaoh. Now, every one of us, every preacher in here, we, we all preach it. We know it's a type of salvation. We preach it as a type of conversion. We all know that. Now, I, I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm just try, I'm trying to, to help you. They, they have already been brought out from under the blood of the Lamb. They, 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 they've been, in essence, the conversion has trans, transpired. This, it's going to be whether or not they're going to continue to move forward with God. And the truth of the matter is, if they don't go in, you know what they're going to do? They're going to forever, ever, ever, in a way, have trouble reconciling their conversion. And you know what a lot of people have problems with today? They come to altar after altar after altar trying to reconcile the fact of whether or not did I say enough, did I act enough, did I believe the right thing, did I do this, did I do that. And you say, what's their problem? I'll tell you what their problem is. They didn't take it in simple faith and allow God to destroy the enemy that's terrorizing them today. See, the truth of the matter is, Brother Josh, they can't go any farther until they take care of this enemy. They're not, they're not going nowhere until they by faith step into that red sea. But you know what they do? They get over there, walk out, type of salvation, type of, type of uh, uh, conversion in their life. They get out there, they're out there in that wilderness about two years, and you know what God does? He starts orchestrating the event again. You know what he tells them? You've been out here, you've been out here around this mountain long enough. It's time, it's time for you to cross over and get over there where I want you to go. And so they do what everybody else does. They, they lean on the arm of the flesh. They send in 12 spies and 10 says we can't have it and 2 says we can. You say, well, what happens, Brother Bob? They're confronted with the enemy that God's trying to take care of. You say, what's that? Amalek, picture of the flesh. You know what? We've got people today that's coming to altar after altar and altar. You know what they're doing? They're, they're, they're in a warfare with the flesh, and they could have took care of that if they'd just crossed over the other side and been obedient to God. One whole generation has to die off before God can do anything with the second. And the second finally comes to the, comes to the Jordan River, and they cross, go on across. And now, the, now we see the defeat of, of an enemy in, in the area of, of, of salvation. We see an enemy in the area of sanctification but then they've got to go in and they've got to, they've got to march around Jericho and he tells them how to do it he tells them he tells them to get over there and everything over there when you go in the first time that's all mine you don't touch it you say you say what, what what's that what's that enemy they're taking care of what that area they're trying to take care of separation you're not to marry them you're not to intermingle with them you're not Listen, you say, why, why do so many of us have trouble with the Gibeonites and the, and the Philistines? i tell you why. Because we're not separated. We're not walking by faith. Amen. Now, I talked about the progression because here's, here's what I want you to understand. The truth of the matter is you can never be separated until you're sanctified. And you can never be sanctified until you're saved. Do, do you understand? I'm talking about the links. I'm talking about way that God has put your life together. 
Uh, he didn't make a suggestion that you might want to walk by faith. He said the just shall live by faith. And the reason it's so important that we live by faith is because God orchestrated the entire Christian life is nothing more than a journey of faith in which you and I respond. And as you and I respond, there's help for the saint. There's a holding and a hindrance to Satan. And there's the honor and the glory of God when you and I live and walk and act by faith. It's not something you choose to do. It's not a suggestion. There is only one way, and I repeat this, there is only one way to live the Christian life. It's by faith. Because God has linked three worlds together. And your response to faith determines the harmony or the hell in those three spheres. And the just shall live by faith.